we've just seen that in the laboratory context, the role of the acid catalyst is key in protonating the central oxygen, which leads to cleavage of the CO bond. In a biochemical context, and in enzyme-catalyzed reactions, intermediates like this are too unstable to be formed, say, in an enzyme's active site. And so enzymes avoid the formation of these, for example, unstabilized positive charges through general acid-base catalysis mechanisms. And because things are considerably more carefully controlled and orchestrated in an enzyme's active site, there are a couple of different mechanisms we see for the enzymatic hydrolysis of polysaccharides. Exotype cleavage, which is typical of lysozymes, is highly analogous to the mechanism we just saw, the acid-catalyzed SN1 mechanism, except that it avoids the formation of an unstabilized O+, something that looks like a protonated ether, we might say, and it does this through general acid catalysis. Instead of protonating O and then cleaving the O carbon-1 bond, the protonation and cleavage events happen in a single elementary step through electron flow like this. As we've done in other contexts, it's helpful, I think, here to engage this oxygen to illustrate that the cation that results, the cation at carbon-1, is actually resonance-stabilized. And there's a resonance structure in which all atoms have an octet. So this is nothing more than an oxocarbenium ion intermediate. And there is evidence for these intermediates in certain polysaccharide hydrolysis mechanisms catalyzed by enzymes. The glycosidic oxygen was never actually positively charged, and so we've directly formed this neutral polysaccharide chain on the other side through general catalysis. And the general acid here, which is a carboxylic acid group on an aspartate side chain, just forms its conjugate base, the corresponding carboxylate. Don't worry too much about the amino acids and the fact that this is enzyme catalyzed just yet. The main point I want to make is that this enzymatic reaction avoids discrete protonation of this oxygen and instead uses general acid catalysis with protonation and bond cleavage happening in a single elementary step. Once this occurs, water enters the picture and water, as we've seen it do in the laboratory reaction, is going to act as a nucleophile toward the oxocarbenium ion. But in order to do this and avoid the formation of positive charge on the oxygen of water, general base catalysis is involved in the enzyme-catalyzed reaction. And so deprotonation occurs at the same time as CO bond formation in this second step, which looks like a general base-catalyzed AD sub N, nucleophilic addition across a polarized pi bond. This leads to the monosaccharide or the smaller polysaccharide product kind of on the left-hand side of our original polymer, if you like. And this regenerates the acid catalyst. Notice that the carboxylate was protonated, so we're going to get the neutral aspartic acid residue back so that the enzyme can catalyze another round of hydrolysis. Another location where we see a need to hydrolyze polysaccharides is in the saliva. Saliva will come in contact with a very large number of starches as we eat anything from cereal to crackers. Many, many things plant-based are going to include polysaccharides that need to be digested by the saliva. And alpha amylase enzymes in the saliva use a slightly different mechanism that we might call endotype cleavage. This is a substitution with ring opening that takes place. In this endotype mechanism, substitution happens in an SN2 type fashion first to actually open the ring of the monosaccharide whose one carbon, whose anomeric carbon, is involved in the glycosidic linkage. And so, in essence, we end up with a unique hemiacetal intermediate structure. At this point, a second SN2 step can take place, again, catalyzed by the general acid and general base, involving this newly formed hydroxyl group as a nucleophile and this CO bond as the bond that's going to break. So let's draw out the acidic proton and the general acid catalyst to get this going. And the idea here again is SN2, but catalyzed by general base and acid. So the base will deprotonate the nucleophile. Remember, bases activate nucleophiles, so the base will deprotonate the nucleophile, which forms a bond to this electrophilic carbon. And the CO bond breaks with this oxygen acting as a leaving group, but not departing with the pair of electrons. Instead, it gets protonated as it departs. Again, 
general acid catalysis, the leaving group is activated through protonation as it departs with a pair of electrons. This gives us the final products, which is just the two separated monosaccharide units. So here's the one on the left with its hydroxyl group that it got from the very first step, still there. And the one on the right is here, and its hydroxyl group was present in the original polysaccharide. It just picked up a proton from the general acid catalyst upon this bond cleavage in the second step. And so we have overall a general acid and general base catalyzed SN2 reaction in the first step at carbon 1, and then a general acid and general base catalyzed SN2 reaction again at carbon 1 to actually separate the monosaccharides. And we can see why it's called an endotype cleavage mechanism because the O carbon 1 bond endocyclic inside the ring of this monosaccharide is broken in the course of this mechanism. We'll have a lot more to say about enzymatic mechanisms in future video series, but I wanted to introduce enzymatic hydrolysis here just to contrast it with laboratory hydrolysis where relatively unstable intermediates are the norm and specific catalysis is typically how things work. In an enzymatic context, we're doing a lot more of business type elementary steps like SN2, beta elimination, and nucleophilic addition with proton transfers occurring at the same time. That changes the character and the quality of the curved arrows.